Good Wednesday to all of you. I am uh, happy to be able to share this time of reflection and study of the Word of God on Wednesday or whenever it is that you are watching it. We're just about midway through August and um, can sort of feel some, some changes among us. Out on my walk this morning I noticed some of the maple trees with the falling of the leaves a little bit early, a little bit darker in the morning. Um, but we still have quite a bit of summer left and a beautiful fall that is ahead. Uh, today, uh, we will be uh, looking indirectly at our second reading from Romans chapter 11. This Sunday is the 11th Sunday after Pentecost, and on the document in front of you, you'll see the four lessons, Isaiah 56, verse 1 and 6 through 8, Psalm 67, Romans 11, uh, 1 through 2a and 29 through 32 and then finally Matthew's gospel 15 uh, 10 through 20 and 21 through 28 just a just a brief note um, you'll notice um, that the verses 10 through 20 are in brackets that means that those verses are optional to read um, but uh, I generally leave those um, sometimes I, I won't read them but for the purpose, I, I just think it's it makes more sense to set up a better context. So uh, I will be reading uh, all of Matthew's Gospel 15, 10 through 28 on Sunday. Um, now, what we're going to be looking at today, though, is, again, as I said, related to a Romans passage. So just let me read that, and then I'll say how I'm going to address that. Um, it says, Paul writes, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people, whom he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they too might now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may be merciful to all. As I was reading um, that lesson this past Monday, I, two things jumped out at me. Uh, the first is in verse 1, the very direct question, um, has God rejected his people? And then finally, uh, the focus uh, on mercy, that God is merciful to all. Uh, we, we know the times we're in, we know um, the battle that we have with this virus, and you know, it's bad enough we have the health issues, but there's a lot of, of course, division about dealing with the virus. And so um, for many, maybe not for you, but for many, these are anxious times. And you know, often when bad things happen, there is sometimes a part of me that will say, you know, where is God? I mean, there's these promises of mercy and love and, and redemption and salvation. And there's this promise that is there before us, but it just doesn't seem to be realized. So you wonder whether God has abandoned us or have we been rejected? Um, and then there's that question about that constant source of mercy and love. So um, I, I was... Uh, at our council meeting last night uh, for the opening devotion, I just happened to start thinking about some of Luther's writings. And one of the articles that I came, uh, came across was found within the Christian century. And uh, what this article was actually addressing uh, was Martin Luther's writings, uh, and this is a writing that he had, whether one may flee from a, a, a deadly plague. And he's addressing there's a plague going on, of course, and uh, he's trying to address uh, for pastors and, and people to not flee, right, but to stay and to be present with the people who are suffering from the plague, as well as understanding that they very well may get it as well. Um, and then, uh, you know, that sort of article then spurned out into the concept of, of Luther um, using this this alien work of God um, meaning that when bad things happen how is God involved 
in that bad thing. Did God create the bad thing or is God just present in the bad thing? Um, because again, we, we have these promises of love and mercy and, and care. And so we can't help but wonder uh, where God is um, within that. So let me just set up a little bit about this alien righteousness, this alien righteousness in Luther's gospel teaching, trying to describe and reconcile bad things, but knowing that there's a love that's there for us as well. Um, so let me just set this up with a couple of paragraphs, and then I'll, I will definitely, uh, hopefully at the end of this, this will all make some sense. It says, what is perhaps the central gospel uh, the, the central gospel distinction in Luther's thought can be seen most clearly in his 1518 sermon, Two Kinds of Righteousness. Here he speaks of the righteousness that comes from outside of us. This righteousness or this standing before God, this is called the righteousness in the presence of God. Um, this quorum, uh, quorum Deo. Um, the second kind that Luther called the righteousness, the Coram Mundo, uh, are good works in the world and for the world, which are not uh, for the saving grace. So it, it's not about, again, we know this about doing good works to be saved, right? That, that grace comes to us as a gift, and as a result of grace, we do good things. So the righteousness, or this quorum Deo, becomes our righteousness by a divine gift. It is not infused into us, nor does it in, inhere within us at some point. Luther says that it is a perfect righteousness acquired entirely from God and Christ and given to us by the Spirit. So it is this alien righteousness, this righteousness of Christ, by which we are made right with God, and it is received by faith. In his early days, Luther struggled to rid himself of this roiling angst about his guilt before a holy God. What little John Staupitz was able to do to console Luther's troubled conscience was enough to turn his sights true north. Staupitz, who was uh, Luther's confessor, who remained a monk to the end of his days, pointed him to a new understanding of Christ and his gifts. This life journey from before Wittenberg to Luther's final days in Erfurt, give rich meaning to his thesis, and I quote, every true Christian, whether living or dead, has part in all the blessings of Christ and the church. And this is granted him by God, even without letters of a pardon. And that this person shares in all of of one's blessings. Um, so there, there's a sense of this, um, this alien righteousness, which means that it, it is not um, in us, right? But, but, but these good things, this grace comes to us from outside of us, which is comforting to me because those moments when I don't feel so good inside, uh, I know that there's, there's this grace that is coming um, from outside of me that I am receiving with grace. Okay, so that's just one one Luther concept that I wanted to share with you um, as a purpose to roll into the second thing that I wanted to discuss in light of the pandemic and also whether we've been abandoned um, or whether we have access to God's mercy. Um, this again comes from um, at least part of it from a writing from Ron Ritgers, um, and he, he writes this in uh, Christianity Today. He says, if we could ask Martin Luther how to make sense of the current pandemic, he would likely encourage us to view it as the alien work of God. The phrase appears in his earliest lectures on the Psalms and again in his lectures on Romans and Hebrews, where he develops the defining contours of his evangelical theology. Luther believed that God is utterly sovereign over all things, including suffering of various kinds. God is even sovereign over Satan, whose plots in the world the Wittenberg reformer took very seriously. 
Luther was very honest about the reality of suffering in the world, along with the pain and and also the despair that it causes. There is nothing Pollyannish about his theology. But Luther firmly believed that God is good. God's very nature is ardent, self-giving love, and this is the foundation for Luther. Human beings, on the other hand, are deeply sinful and strongly prone uh, to self-glory in all things, which is, again, just as a pause to point back to that alien sense of righteousness, right? If, if we inherently have this brokenness in us, um, then righteousness needs to come from outside of us. All right, so again, that, that points to that alien righteousness that I addressed in the very first part. Even Christians um, have to engage in a daily life or death battle with the old Adam or the old Eve, which they can only win with, with grace. Many are also prone, as he was himself prone, to see God as an angry judge who is easily provoked to wrath. Luther knew firsthand that when such souls experience suffering, they nearly always view it as a punishment for sins. So the phrase, the alien work of God, just that also is the second part to this alien righteousness, but the phrase, the alien work of God, was Luther's pastoral response uh, in the midst of the plague and the pandemic of his time, putting all these beliefs and concerns back together and offering some comfort in the midst of overwhelming suffering. The term expresses Luther's desire to assure Christians that God is for them, never against them, despite appearances to the contrary. Pretty, pretty good to hear that today. According to Luther, suffering is God's work, that is, that God is the ultimate cause, although not necessarily its immediate cause. God can, can use the devil or other agents as tools to accomplish his larger redemptive purposes in the world. But suffering is not God's proper work, which is always to love and save. Suffering is alien to God in the sense that it is foreign to God's nature and intentions, even though God is still sovereign over it. Very important part there. This means that in the midst of suffering, faithful Christians shouldn't read their lives for signs of God's attitude toward them, but rather they should trust what Scripture says about God, that God is good, not what fallen reason concludes, that God is not. Um, Which, again, this is the purpose of why we're doing these Bible studies and why we go to worship and why we have devotions. um, To continually remind us um, about what Scripture says, that God is good. Um, That's so important. And it may seem obvious, like, duh, I know that. But, you know, there's enough forces that are lining up against us to convince us that God is not good and that there are good things. Um, So, uh, hence, uh, we need to have that word, that alien righteousness that comes into us uh, to reinforce that and to remind us. Luther thought that if people relied on their own unaided efforts to find and understand God in the midst of the reality of suffering, they would wind up concluding that God is absent or that God doesn't love humans. But by faith, Luther believed that we can see through suffering to the true nature of God. So seeing through the suffering, not um, not avoiding the suffering, not um, seeing the suffering as the final statement of God, but you see through the suffering... And when you go through the suffering, then you see the true nature of God. Luther's emphasis on suffering as the alien work of God was also connected to his larger conviction that God is mostly hidden from our view in this life. God can be discovered, however, in the last place that fallen human reason would expect to find God, and that is the cross. In fact, Luther once inserted, drawn directly on 1 Corinthians 1, 18 uh, through 2 through 5, that, and I quote, God can be found only in suffering and the cross. That's the least likely places that people would ever look for God, right? But 
That is where God is found. According to Luther, God hides from view to confront us with our sin, which often necessitates this veil and to drive us to know God by faith, which is itself a divine gift. Luther refers to such faith as an art or a craft, stressing that while faith is essential to the Christian life, it is also difficult, requiring daily practice in the surrender to God. In his treatise on good works, Luther explains how such faith rescues the Christian from despair during suffering. It is an art, and this, and this actually comes from Luther, it is an art to have a sure confidence in God when at least as far as we can see or understand, he shows himself in wrath and to expect better from him than we, know, than, than we now know. Here God is hidden, as the bride says in the Song of Songs, behold, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in through the windows. That means that he stands hidden among the sufferings which would separate us from him like a wall, indeed like a wall or of a fortress. And yet he looks upon me and does not forsake me. He stands there and is ready to help in grace. And through the window of dim faith, he permits himself to be seen. And Jeremiah says in Lamentations, and I quote, He cast men aside, but that is not the intention of his heart. Uh, that's the end of uh, Luther's uh, writing on that. So um, this is going to be a much shorter um, Bible study. Um, I'm going to read just a few final paragraphs to try to summarize and place um, this this alienness, right? Uh, you know, alien, at least the word alien has a rather negative term, <laughs> um, Movies that have the title Alien are not usually very pleasant movies. Um, you know, aliens come to destroy or to kidnap or they're animals or, you know, whatever. But um, alien, uh, this alien righteousness, right, this, this outside form um, coming to us and also coming um, among us. Uh, on the Bible study sheet, you're going to see the full text uh, let me just skip over to that here. I have two documents that are up. Um, this comes um, from Luther's works, where he is, uh, that's the full text of him encouraging people during the time of plague, you know, to stay put, right? To not flee. Um, and what why I'm providing that to you is many people may not have read anything that Luther has written. It It is an adjustment to read Luther. Um, he, it, it almost sounds, um, how can I say this? His language at times can be rather harsh. Um, but, you know, you really have to understand Luther's context, right? Um, and also Luther's time. But one of the things that you will definitely note, and why I wanted to provide this to you, and you can read it at your own leisure, is when Luther writes how he always references scripture. Um, He's interpreting scripture, right? But he's he's saying, my writings or what I'm sharing with you is not something I'm making up, but it, it's coming from scripture. Uh, and boy, Luther was very well versed within scripture. Um, I think you know that, but to remind it, this is his use of language, his, his understanding of language, his ability to interpret the Bible from those original languages. Um, all of his writings that he did on scripture, um, it's just it's absolutely tremendous what what this person was able uh, to produce. So I, I wanted to, um, it's, it's very lengthy, uh, but I at least had it in front of me, and I thought, uh, you know, why not? Uh, some of you may want to, you know, study it on your own, a reference, go back and read those scriptures. And I do trust that if you read your way through it, you'll find some things that are helpful, and uh, also to get... Uh, a little bit more comfortable with Luther's writing and uh, also his style, okay? Um, so, the final uh, paragraphs. Uh, oh, and then before I actually do that, um, this may not seem very appropriate, but um, yesterday was uh, Erie Gibbs, and I'm going to be sure to be sharing this on many different platforms. Um, 
there was just a, a tremendous amount of generosity that was shown to Lutheran World Church and Academy. Um, I believe, I, I looked at it this morning, I think there was uh, roughly a little over $33,000 that was given to this ministry. And what I say ministry, ministry means church and school because we are a shared ministry. Um, I think there were over 60 to 70 givers. So um, also too, um, we had our council meeting last night and our uh, offerings continue to come in um, in a very generous way. Um, so um, the council president, Les Phobes and myself are gonna be over the next month making sure that we share with the congregation where we're at as a ministry. Um, it's different, right? But um, because of what you're doing, because of your remaining connected to us by your continued offerings, um, we are here. And uh, I just wanted to say thank you. So there's going to be many expressions of that over the next month, month and a half. But I'm just going to try to take every forum to keep you as updated as possible uh, to know that when you mail in those offerings or online or you make a phone call to somebody or you participate in a Bible study or just whatever you're doing to remain connected to the church, uh, I just wanted to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Okay, so here's the recap. Uh, Luther, the father of evangelical Protestants, would want the faithful Christian to know that COVID-19 is not the proper work of God but rather it is the alien work of God that summons us to know the true intentions of his heart by the art of faith, even as it is working to conform us to the image of Christ and his self-sacrificial love. Luther would want to console us with these words, especially those of us who are inclined to doubt or, or despair. The current pandemic is dark and menacing for many of us. And it's easy to wonder whether there is a good and sovereign God in heaven or not. Luther would welcome and even encourage such honest questions. But he would finally want to teach us how to glimpse our loving yet hidden God as he beholds us in grace through the window he has placed in this wall of suffering. This window is faith. It is a dim faith which clings passionately yet always imperfectly to the word of God and its promises that God loves us in all things, including suffering. Dim faith may be all that we can muster in these difficult days. It is frequently all that I can muster, but it can suffice to assure us of what we most need in knowing, that our God is with us and for us in this crisis that God does not forsake us, but eagerly seeks to help us. For this is God's true heart. All of this may seem strange to us, but such is the alien work of God. So this was very enjoyable for me to share this with you today. And I do hope um, it was a little bit different, but I do hope it's expanding the way that we study scripture, that we're exposed to new topics, and uh, so I'm always honored and privileged to be able to share it with you, the good people of Lutheran World Church and Academy. Bye-bye.